Hello and welcome to this short presentation from the Diabetes Out There, or DOT for short, team based here at Tayside Children's Hospital. I'm Scott Graham, one of the nurses in the team. We're a group of doctors, nurses, a dietitian and psychologist who collectively take care of children with diabetes in the NHS Tayside catchment area council areas which include North East Fife, Angus, Dundee City and Perth and Kinross. Much of the content can be found on our website and also on our service app which is hosted on Health the Zone UK and by searching for diabetes out there. The intended audience for this presentation is for young people living with type 1 diabetes and their families and carers. It's primarily aimed at people who are relatively recently diagnosed within the preceding months. However, it can serve as a useful checklist um, of knowledge for young people who perhaps are established with their diabetes but taking on more of the self-management roles appropriate for their age and stage. Much of the content can be found on our website, which can be searched in a search engine by searching diabetes out there, NHS Tayside. It's not intended as a substitute for keeping in touch with the team, especially if you're new to diabetes and just starting on that journey. What we will cover includes the following topics shown on screen. Firstly, a recap on what is diabetes. We'll also look at glycosylated haemoglobin or HbA1c for short, and some of the other metrics that we use to monitor the condition over time. This includes average blood glucose, time and range, glucose variability, and also we'll briefly touch on sensor glucose versus blood glucose and other emergent technologies. We'll revisit your target blood glucose. And we will also look at some of the acute complications that can arise from type 1 diabetes. These include diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA for short and also hypoglycemia or low blood glucose. Finally, we'll discuss some of the expectations, both in terms of what support you can expect from the team, the ways of working in partnership to support your young person with their journey on diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is most likely come as an unexpected and certainly an unwelcome new diagnosis, bringing a huge burden of new information and new emotions. Take a moment to consider your journey so far and what you've already achieved. You will be becoming familiar with carbohydrate counting and estimations You will be very familiar with the daily routine of insulin injections before meals and checking glucose levels and thinking how nearly everything in life can impact glucose levels. So you may ask yourself, why are you doing all of this? You as a young person living with the condition or a parent or carer are trying to replicate how a pancreas would work by giving insulin on demand with the new tools that you have. It may seem daunting and overwhelming at first as you get used to all these new 
skills and the anxiety that can be attached. You're doing this to try and achieve healthy glucose levels, which will limit the risk of longer term complications and also minimize the day to day burden of managing type 1 diabetes. If you achieve all this, your hard work will pay off. How do we know that we're achieving this? Well, we're aiming to keep blood glucose levels in a healthy range as near normal for as much of the time as is possible. For a pre-meal, this is to try and have a, a blood glucose between four and seven. And it will be difficult to maintain all of the levels. However, the majority of the levels in this range will ensure um, good health in the longer term. Equally, the main side effect of taking insulin artificially is that you can at times have a mismatch where there's too much insulin and not enough glucose in the circulation. This is called a low blood glucose or a hypo for short. You shouldn't be experiencing more than one or two mild, easy to treat lows in a typical week. If you are, it's important to speak to the DOT team to make adjustments to your insulin doses or settings. One of the measurements that we use to measure glucose over time is called glycosylated haemoglobin A1c or HbA1c for short. The target for this in the first year after diagnosis is to keep it below 48. This will be measured when you start coming along to clinics, usually from about four months following your diagnosis and at regular intervals thereafter, at least twice a year. It's, in some ways, it can be easier to achieve this target within the first year as your pancreas is still producing some of its own insulin, which makes achieving target glucose levels somewhat easier in most cases. Beyond a year, we're still hoping to keep the HB1C within a target between 48 and 58 millimoles per mole. HbA1c reflects the glucose levels over the preceding two, three months prior to it being measured via a finger prick blood test. Because of this, it's nearly always high at the time of diagnosis. And we would expect it to come down once you're on treatment with insulin. The picture here shows you a, a red blood cell, which are constantly being replaced. And if there's excess glucose in your circulating bloodstream, these glucose molecules will attach to the haemoglobin molecule. And it's an easy measure for a lab test. This will also give you a reflection of your day-to-day -day glucose that you can measure with the glucose meter that you have. You can see here HB1C in a traffic light system and along the bottom you can see how you can use your average blood glucose to anticipate where your HB1C may sit. In the example shown, an average blood glucose of 7.8, you would expect an HB1C to come back in target at 48 millimoles per mole. However, do remember that HB1C measures glucose levels over time and may not truly reflect um, what's been happening in over a longer time. We know that HbA1c, if measured over a lifetime, 
of somebody with diabetes is a good indicator of your relative risk of the associated complications that arise from high blood glucose levels. These include retinopathy, problems with your eyes, nephropathy, problems with your kidneys, neuropathy, problems with your nerves, and microalbumin, which um, can be detected in a urine sample. All of these complications um, will be screened for from the age of 12, independent of the duration of your diabetes. This evidence is based on long-term follow-up of individuals and how they compare to similarly aged, gender matched individuals who don't have diabetes. It's therefore a good predictor of your relative risk of these complications. The DOC team will work with you to improve and attain the best glucose control as is possible to reduce these potential risks. You can see why there's such an emphasis on the numbers. We worry about the long-term outcomes and reducing the risk, which are, mo as already stated, are mostly related to high blood glucose levels. Con conversely, if you can keep your levels the majority of the time in target, these risks will be reduced down to that of the general population. Looking for a moment at blood glucose specifically, the aim is to keep levels pre-meal between four and seven. If you're checking out with pre-meal times, it's likely to be higher as the insulin will have a delay in taking effect. So how do we achieve all this and keep the glucose levels in a healthy range? Having a good routine from the start is certainly one of the things which underpins this. We know from studies that people who check their levels between five and seven times a day tend to have better overall target glucose. Counting and estimating your carbohydrates is clearly an important life skill to get to grips with and in matching your carbs and your insulin as accurately as possible. Another consideration is the timing of your insulin in relation to eating, as well as the types of food and how they digest and change into glucose. For this reason, typically you're best to aim to give the insulin 15 minutes before you eat. This gives it the best chance of matching well and maintaining glucose levels. It's very important to rotate your injection sites. We know that lots of children and young people when starting out doing insulin injections like to feel in control, but we will always encourage you to use new sites that you perhaps haven't tried for a while or before. These include the tops of your thighs, your buttocks, your tummy, your abdomen and occasional use of the upper outer aspects of your arms is also okay as part of rotation. If you overuse the same site too many times there is a risk that you will end up with lumps or lipohypertrophy. This can in turn interfere with how predictably the insulin is absorbed and it can lead to erratic and unpredictable glucose levels.